<laughs> you see, so we were just talking for a moment about quantum. Well, when, we, when you get into this stuff here now, now, now you, you have to approach this from a whole different standpoint because you realize that there are subatomic particles that you've always considered to be Holy Spirit, things that you couldn't see, that have this massive power that are... <laughs> I was reading about a, an, an experiment, Albert, they did in 1992, I think, where they set up electrons to follow a particular path, but they set a block down along the path so that the electron would be blocked from going. The electron started, stopped, perceived there was a block, made a left turn and went a different direction. In other words, the electron realized there's a blockage down there, we have to take another route. So the electron thought. The electron had a thinking process. And not only they said that the electron think we better not go down that way because there's a blockage, but they commuted to other electrons, don't go that way. And all the electrons that weren't even involved in this started moving in a different direction. So now you have things that think. And this is all going on in the, in the universe that you live in, and you know nothing about it. Because we've gone to churches and sat in religion and had them tell us all this, you know, bizarre things that they tell us. But so here, you're reaching a point where you start dabbling in things called, oh my goodness, you have a chance. Would you set up that, if you don't mind, or somebody, uh, Charles, who's Charles? Could you set up that thing for me, in the, the star map? Star map? Yeah. Now or later? Or yeah, if you could set it up, I'd appreciate it. The, the easel is... <laughs> <laughs> the easel is right there. Um, so, when you start looking at things such as quantum, and you, and you look at things such as subatomic particles, and you realize that there is something going on that you and I can't see that is moving throughout the consistency of life and your bodies and, and the universe, and, and these things think. There is a consciousness out there. I want to I wanna put it at the higher one here, if you can get these down. There's a consciousness out there and things think. Electron thinks. Lights think. Light thinks. Photons think. If, if, you, if, you, if you're going to shine a, a light and you cut a slit in a cardboard so that the light will go through the slit and reflect on a screen behind it, the light will change. It'll change from particles of light to waves of light. Just by what you do, the light says, we're not going to do this way. We're going to go a different direction. So all of these things are going on, and, and people are sitting in churches studying, the, you know. So, so now w w we're looking at... Um, okay. Now we're looking at a universe. We're looking at a universe in which we're on the eve, I think October 23rd, they're making the announcement of the discovery of the, of the next planet, which will be three days from now. And the seventh planet is, is being discovered. The seventh planet that has a sun to revolve around. That's, that in and, it's, in and of itself is bizarre because that's never been seen before. Remember the first one they discovered was in Pegasus, which fulfills that revelation statement, a white horse, behold a white horse. Then you look at the structure of your kundalini or your chakra involvement. It goes from Virgo, which is virgin consciousness, no thought, to Leo, which is the pineal gland of the brain. And that's the way the operation goes in the six, the five in between. Well, after the first planet with a sun star was found in October in Pegasus, then the next one was found in Virgo. And the seventh one, Lalandi 21185, I believe it is, is in Leo, the pineal gland. And so what's happening? The universe, or let's call it the sky, because universe sounds too awesome. It's called the, the sky is having a kundalini. The sky is experiencing the seven chakras. Now what's happening, what happens on the earth? 
You move from December or September or whatever, October, November, December, January, February, March, April. You move seven months from, I think it's about October, November, when the sun goes through the cross, to April or May, and you go from the winter to the spring. Or in other words, the Passover. And there's seven months. <coughs> so you have seven chakras, you have seven months, you have the seven planets. All of these things are in harmony with one another. And they're all in the Bible. Joshua walks around the walls how many times before the walls fall down? Seven. They blow what? Ram's horns. What is the ram's horns? The power of the ram. And who's the ram? Aries. What is the power of the ram? Is that when the sun consumes Aries, you pass over from winter to spring? All of these things are harmonizing. And where's the ram? Inside of you, it's the pineal gland of the brain. And so it says in the Passover that you must... You must, you must cook the lamb. Why? What's that got to do with anything? That's silly. What are you going to cook a lamb? I thought this was religious stuff. This is like, a, you know, a restaurant. What is this? <laughs> but why do you cook a lamb? You cook a lamb because the, high, the whole idea of this is teaching you that the fire, which is the sun, must consume the lamb, which is Aries, in order for spring to come. And it happens. Because right now the sun is preparing to go through the cross. Look. See what that is? That's the cross. You come up and look at it closer when you get, that's the cross. That's the southern cross. The sun is preparing to go through the cross. Right now it goes through it in November. And then it will sit right here. Three days and three nights in the winter solstice in the tomb of the earth. And then it will make what they call in astronomy and what the scientists say, the sun will do an RA. You know what an RA is? Right ascension. It'll ascend to sit at the right hand, and it'll consume here, which is Aries, and you'll pass over from winter to spring. That's why Jesus is crucified. Because he's the sun passing through, the, through this cross, sitting three days and three nights in the tomb of the winter solstice. I don't think you folks can see this, can you? Can you see it? Well... You know, ask me about it later. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then it, and, and, and then it comes over here where you have your summer solstice. So the whole thing is built around astronomy. How can you possibly function in the way you want to function and the way your children want to function for the good of the earth? Or the, and the reason that the earth is, has been in the mess that it's been in and the reason you've had all the violence and all the cancers and all the terrible things is because people have totally ignored this. Totally ignored it. It's like going in your house and ignoring your bathroom. <coughs> well, you know, you're not going to use that. Use the living room. The heck with it. <laughs> oh, sure, it's disgusting. It's, it sounds terrible. That's what you've done here. You've totally ignored this. You don't know anything about how this operates. Don't know what your, what, this is, this, this is your house. You live in a house, wherever, whatever town you live in, but you, your house is in this house. This is, you live on the earth, and the earth lives in this house, and you know absolutely nothing about it. And the people that you've gone to to give you instruction on how to live life in churches have told you, stay away from this. You know, stay away from this. And so now, as we find that the earth is moving through the new age of uh, Aquarius and, and that the planets are being discovered and so forth and so on, and the, the, the sevens are harmonizing and we learn and we come to the point of saying, well, now we should study the seven seals. And you, in order to study the seven seals, you've got to go through three chapters. You can't just go to chapter six is where you open the seals. You can't go there. You have to go to Revelation four, preparatory, five is the occult power, and six is the opening. And today we're going to complete four. We're going to wrap four up. We're going to wind it up. Four. So we will have completed the preparatory and moving into the power aspect of the seven seals before we begin to open them one by one. What are some of the things that we learned so far? Okay. In, 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 in reading Revelation 4, first of all, we, we understood about the door. There's an opportunity. You have an opportunity because you're sitting here and you're hearing this stuff. And what's beautiful about all of this is it's totally up to you. You can thumb your nose at it like most people do, or you can get involved in it, and that's up to you. If you want to get involved in it, I'll tell you right now, you cannot possibly 
get involved in understanding what quote unquote God is about without some way getting involved in understanding what life is about, what science and what nature is about. You don't have to be a rocket scientist, but I mean, you can't go on living your life dabbling in Noah's Ark and Adam and Eve and all of these stories that are symbols of scientific truths. We learned about that. We learned about the trumpet, which is own. And you have an opportunity, and the first thing that you have to understand is there is within you this sound which is own. There is within the universe that sound which is own. So, so the opportunity, first of all, brings you to a, a confrontation with yourself. We learned that. We learned of two things. We learned about jasper, which is white, and we learned about sardine, which is red, and we knew that in as much as we turn within ourselves to find Om, there is the need for a purified mind, which is separating from thought, and our emotional nature to be restricted or to be brought into this thing. So the, the use of our emotional nature and our mind is important to understand. We learned about the rainbow, remember? The rainbow, which has the seven colors and the seven chakras, and it's a razor-thin rainbow. It's a rainbow bridge that takes you through from the earth up into the, uh, through the water to the sky, uh, up to the fire. And this rainbow bridge is very narrow and sharp like a razor. And many people start walking up that bridge but never ever do get to the other side because it's so easy to fall off. And those are the distractions I'm talking about. And sometimes if I say things that people get upset about it and say, well, I'm trying to put, you know, I'm putting people on guilt trip. And that's not the case. I'm just telling you what the words say. I mean, you know, why? If somebody can tell you, hey, look, if you're driving your car on a, on a dark road somewhere and you don't know that uh, the, the warning signs have been taken down and you're going to go over the end of a cliff and your car's going to explode and you and everybody in your car is going to get killed, wouldn't you want somebody to say you shouldn't do that? Is it bad? Is that putting anybody on a guilt trip by saying, you know, you really shouldn't go that way? What I would love to see for you is a consumption in this thing to the point where as this unleashes itself and, and turns loose all of this wonderful power in this, in this age of enlightenment, that you're part of it. You can't be part of it if you put... I had a fellow last night talking to me. He said he's been through every conceivable meditational technique that there is. He has studied every book. He's gone to every type of meeting, and he's never found anything. And he's done it all. He even went to India or somewhere. And he, and he, and he said, what the heck's wrong? And this is what I said to him. I said, you know, I'll tell you something. With all the techniques, with all the things that have been written about meditation, there's not one person that can sit down with you and tell you that they've experienced anything other than what some type of an emotional experience they've had while sitting on the floor. And what has that done for starving children? What has that done for the abused animals? What has it done for nature? What has it done for people? Nothing. And so I said, well, then you have the opportunity. You can either try to do it or you can let God do it. And that's the beautiful thing. You don't have to know. All you have to be willing is to walk on this bridge, but you have to at least put some time into it. You have to discipline yourself. And then the things will happen, and the things will change in your life, and the things will change in your body, and all of these things will start to develop for you because you tried. But all that re is required of you is to be still. It's like Vinny was saying, if you sit on a plane and then put Qatar or whatever, and just to be still and, and to stay with that and to realize there is this wonder inside of you and let God bring it to you. Let God find it for you. Let God light it up for you. And don't be too anxious. Be as anxious to touch Kundalini as you would to stick your finger. If I was to take that light bulb out of there, would you stick your finger in it? No, you wouldn't. Why? Because it'll whack you. Well, if you touch this stuff and you don't know what you're doing, it's going to whack you too. But once you understand it, as we're gonna, you're going to understand it, and then you touch it. It's a whole different thing. It's the difference of having your back turned to the wave and you get hit in the back of the head with a big wave or having a surfboard and riding it. So we learned about that and we, we learned about the 24 seats, remember? The 4 and 20 elders. And we learned about, this is the 24 right here. The zodiacal makeup, the universal makeup through the zodiac and through the constellations is, made, is, is, is charted through astronomers in 24 sections. It starts right up here and it goes around to 24 o'clock. So the four and 20 were the 24 and the four, the, the fourfold nature. We understood this. It, it all comes back to us. We learned about lightning and thunder. 
You know, as a fellow was saying, well, how long should I meditate? Well, what does it say? What does Jesus say? As lightning comes from the east to the west, that's how fast it comes. How long do you have to meditate? How long does it take for lightning to flash? In the twinkling of an eye. Twink how long does it take for you to blink your eye? That's how long. That's how long. So when you sit and you wait and you wait and you're waiting for things to develop and you're studying things, understand it comes just like that. And how do you judge your meditation? A lot of people judge your meditation on an experience they had while sitting on the floor. That's your emotional nature. Judge your meditation. How do you feel? How's the way you treated people changing? How's the way you treat animals and nature changing? How's the way you treat children changing? How do you think? Do you feel? Do you understand? Are you starting to become you know, meaningful? Do you start now to have a, have a meaningful concern about, you know, the universe and, 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 and the cosmos and your part in it? And th that's when you start to understand whether your meditation is working or not. I can tell you, for most of you that I talk to, your meditation is working just fine. You're doing very well. Just by the questions you ask and the interest that you have. So a lady came to me last night, last night in New York City, and she says, since I met you, she says, I got all these books with all of these quantum physicists. She says, I never even heard of this stuff before. She's collecting all of these books and getting it because she now, she, she says, it's so interesting. She's a part of it. And, and so that's where meditation will take you. It'll take you into a whole new avenues. Remember we talked about in, in Revelation 4, the seven lamps burning. Because the sun has to go through the seven months, and the solar plexus fire has to touch the seven chakras and light the seven lamps. And then we, they talked about the crystal glass sea, remember? The meditative aspect that, that, that you just float on this, on this sea like crystal, and the, and the, in, in the solitude of it, and the, and the clarity of it. And we talked about the eyes and the being able to see, the perception, the being able to understand, and then the four beasts. The lion of Leo, the calf of Taurus, the man of Aquarius, and the eagle of Scorpio. So if you open to page 1004, we probably have five minutes to do the rest of this. And, uh, <laughs> but we don't have to rush. And I'm not going, you know, and, you know I'm, not, I'm just not going to rush this now. Uh, because there, there is no need for that. It's much, much more prudent for us just to take our time. And... Um, do this in a way that you understand it and you feel comfortable with it. So basically what we've learned so far in Revelation 4 is that we and this universe, this cosmos, are, are, are one entity. And we interact with each other. You cannot be separated from the stars. You cannot be separated from the subatomic activity that goes on. You cannot be separated from that which is nature. That's been our downfall. It's, a t it's been terrible. I mean, God, whatever you want to call it, gave you the earth, the most magnificent jewel in, 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 in the universe, a, a magnificent place. The Alps and Hawaii and oceans and music and ice cream and pussycats and all of these wonderful things were made. And what have we done with it? Pillaged and raped and bombed and warred and separated people from one another and, and concocted all of these wild religious stories to get people scared and filled in guilt trips. And we've wrecked the whole thing and we've missed it completely, totally. So now here's a time where you're coming back you're coming back to what? You're coming back to Pia Mater. You're coming back to your mother. Do you know something? Every one of you sitting in this room has not a vague idea of who you are. Do you know why? Because what you think who you are is nothing more than a creation that was done on you from the time you were born. You were molded by your parents, by your school, by your churches, by your government, and you stand up and say, this is who I am. No, it isn't. This is who they made you out to be. And now you're coming back to a point of relinquishing all of that, flushing it away to find out who you really are. Who would you have been? You were raised wherever, by your mom and dad in your house. Well, what would you be today if you were raised someplace else? Wonder if, wonder if wherever you were born, you had been born someplace else, or different parents, you would be a completely different person. You wouldn't have the interest you have now. You wouldn't have the feelings. Some of you wouldn't have the diseases that you have. Some of you wouldn't have the problems that you have. You might have new problems or worse problems, or, but you'd be completely different because you are, you're wearing a mask that was given to you by the people that raised you. 
And so who are you really? And now what you have to do, you have to shed your skin. You have to shed that covering that was built around you by all the people that wanted you to be the way they wanted you to be the way they are. And they've made you this way. Now you're ready to shed all of that and return to Pia Mater, return to the tender mother, return to that which is the cosmic identity which you had before they put your hands on. When you were in the womb, you were the universe. You were part of God. When you came out of the womb, you were part of God. But then somebody swept you up into their arms and you became a challenge for somebody else to raise and make the, to their image and likeness. Well, that's what you are. And so now, <laughs> now, what does the Bible and every book that's created, whether it be the Koran or the Vedas or the Sutras, say that you must do? You must die to self. You must get rid of the nature that was given to you by your people. You must get out of the clan. You must eliminate yourself from connection to the, to the tribe, to the denominations, to the nationality, to all of these things that you were given which have separated you from your true identity. And then as you do, you'll start to find who you are. And we look at Revelation chapter 4 on page 1004. In Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8, and as you can see, we're almost done with Revelation chapter 4. And the four beasts, each of them had six wings. The four beasts had six wings. Let's look at compass points. North, south, east, and west. We can use that from the earth, right? There is a north, isn't there? There's a south, there's an east, and there's a west. What about you? Well, you've got an emotional nature, right? You've got a physical nature, south. You've got an intellectual nature, west. You've got a spiritual nature, east. So then you harmonize with them. In the same way that there are 12 signs in the zodiac, and there are 12 constellations in the ecliptic that the sun passes through, you have 12 cranial nerves in your brain. Why don't you have 7 or 8 or 9 or 10 or 13? Why do you have 12? Because here you have the plug that fits into the outlet that's there. Did you ever try to put a, a, a three-pronged electrical plug into an outlet that only has two holes in it? <laughs> you have to break the thing. It doesn't, that's right. <laughs> That's right. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So, and so, so what you have to do then is you have to realize that there's got to be a harmony. So if you, have your, if you have your plug and that's your brain and you have 12 cranial nerves in your brain and the universe has an outlet, it has 12 holes in the outlet, so then your plug goes into the to the outlet. So now we found out that there are four compass points, there is a fourfold nature, but let's look at also the four as what? Let's come over here to the universe. We have the vernal equinox, we have the summer solstice, we have the uh, fall equinox, and we have the winter solstice. But these had six wings. Each solstice has six wings. Yeah? One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. You go from one to six, from six to twelve, from twelve to eighteen, and from eighteen to twenty-four. So the four beasts, the four, uh, the equinox pattern of the universe is separated by sixes. And the four and the sixes give you the four and twenty-four. And so basically, the four beasts with the six wings takes you from your own emotional, spiritual, physical, intellectual, and then plugs you into the macro, which is the earth, north, east, west, and south. And now we plug into the four equinoxes, the four beasts with the six wings. Right. So, and, and who are the four beasts? The four beasts are, are a man which would be, in this particular case, the vernal through Aries, the summer solstice, the lion Leo, the autumn, which is the calf Taurus, and the winter, which is the eagle, which is Scorpio. So, 
Look what it says in Revelation 4, 8 then. And, and, they're, and, and they're full of eyes within. And what does that mean? It's understanding. That's the most important thing. The most important thing is the fact that you can sit with people because you understand. You, you understand. You'll be, at least you're beginning to understand. And some of you have a great grasp on this. You're beginning to understand that this whole thing, and you'll see it really clear. And as many, I know it's tough on Sunday nights and you get the World Series. I understand all of that. But if you could come out tonight and spend some time with this and this quantum physics, I think you'd really enjoy it because this is the key to understanding what your religious experience that you've tried to, to sort out is all about. Suddenly you find out that you're going to gravitate in this, in this period of time away from preachers and religion and, and all of that business and m into the arms of science. You talk about preachers and religion. I've got to read you this. Bill gave it to me. Are you ready for this? I don't think you are. St. Petersburg, Florida. A Ro and and I'm, re I'm not knocking anybody. I'm just reading this out of the newspaper. A Roman Catholic priest secretly married for 15 years, was suspended, and another resigned after admitting he had used $225,000 in church funds to pay off a former male lover. It was left to Bishop Lynch to explain at a news conference how two priests in his diocese had broken their vows. Reverend Clark was suspended five weeks ago after Lynch got a copy of his marriage license in the mail. One guy is married, nobody knows it, and the other guy takes $225,000 of church funds to pay off his male lover. And these people are standing up on platforms telling you how to straighten your life out. These people are sitting in dark rooms while other people come in and kneel and confess to them. Here's a guy taking $225,000 and people are going in and, and, and saying, forgive me, Father. What? <laughs> But, they, they, but, you know, but these people have set the foundation for your children. Your little children go in and are taught by these people. I mean, let's you know, look around. and so Now we see, isn't it time to answer to a higher authority? Isn't it time to, 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 to get away from all of these things, these people? There was a show on television in India. They have all these people that can make things happen, you know, and... And then there's, there's, there's a group going around in India in a pickup truck, and they're all fake. They're all, they're all, you know, sleight of hand guys. It's all a fake. It is all a fraud. What happens must happen through science. And we're starting to find out that wonders are there, but we've got to begin to mature and understand these things. That's why we're doing this. So their eyes are full of understanding, and that's where you have to get. You want to see if your meditation, don't judge your meditation on how you experience, well, the music was too loud, the music was too soft, the floor was hard, and my feet were cold, whatever that. Don't judge it by that. It has nothing to do with it. Remember, it comes to you in the twinkling of an eye as a bolt of lightning. You could spend four and a half hours in meditation and actually the input from quote unquote God could be less than a second. Less than a second. Blink your eyes, that's it. The rest of it's what? For you, go ahead. Listen to the music, whatever. Less than a second. Or you can follow these types of, of, of things for people. That now, you got five, a guy said to me last night, well, what about visualization? Does visualization have? Certainly it does. Visualization has a great place to play in healing. Visualizing healing. You know, sending, visualizing a healing to another person. We start, when you start to understand what you've got on top of your shoulders and you start to learn how to use it, you know, I mean, Nowadays, the big thing, and it's with me too, is on the internet. Everybody's on the World Wide Web and in their community. That World Wide Web was always there. Nobody, it's always been there. It's been there for thousands of years. We just learned how to use it. Okay. And this is, this is what you're doing now. You're starting to learn how to use, talk about the World Wide Web. This is Microsoft, Windows 95. <laughs> you got right between your ears. But you don't know how to use it. And why don't you know how to use it? Because you've gone to places where they said, don't touch that. Don't touch this. Like they used to tell you when you were a little kid, don't touch that. You'll go blind. <laughs> 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 I, don't like, 
And a lot of you have glasses on. <laughs> but go to page 789 and look for a minute. And look what Jesus said. And he was talking about the people that have instructed you. The kind of things we're reading about here uh, in, in, you know, in these newspaper articles about <coughs> religious people who do these things and, and then cut up and are telling other people how to live. It says in, in Matthew chapter 13, and in verse 13, I speak in parables because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. I mean, you, you have gone to church all of your life and you've heard stories about Adam and Eve. Did anybody even infer in all the years that you went in and out of churches that Adam could have meant Adam, A-T-O-M, nuclear fission? No. Never even thought of it. That maybe re removing a rib from Adam meant removing an electron from an A-T-O-M causing nuclear fission and creation to happen. In other words, saying that that was actually all beginnings came from the splitting of the atom. Did anybody ever tell you that? No. And why? Why didn't anybody ever think of that? Because it would have violated their re religious ability to talk to you about two naked people running around talking to a snake in a, in a wood somewhere. And you bought that. You stood up with them after they told you two naked people didn't have any shorts on. The snake said, hey, you better get your pants on. And, and uh, here, I have an apple and all this. And you, you never even questioned it. Oh, it's all right with me. You got up and said, praise God, lifted your hands and sang a song. Held hands with one another, you know, and all this kind of stuff. You're two naked people. And here's the guy that wrote the story up there saying, I don't believe this. I do not believe this. I thought they... they And, that's where, and, and where have they got? I can tell you today, you can go to one churches today and somewhere they're talking about two naked people and a snake talking to them. <laughs> I haven't gotten a step with it. All right, real quick. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8. All right, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8. And they are full of eyes, and they rest not day or night. You know what this means? It means if this is to work for you, it's got to be an obsession. You read all of this. You know what? You know what reading all of this stuff does to you? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Reading it, listening to tapes, absolutely nothing. Other than it, it entertains you. It steers your head away from, but I mean, it's nothing. Because you look and say, has your development come from reading, or has your development come from changing your mind? And what has changed your mind? It is the power inside of you. See? So distractions come. I just had a, a whole week full of distractions. But it didn't take me away from the fact that, you know, when the distractions are over, I have to get home. And I don't mean landing in Newark Airport. I mean landing here, within. And then staying on this rainbow bridge is a, is a wonderful thing, and that power comes within you. And we, we come upon now a great um, mantra that is used by many of the people of the East. And it says, in the four beasts, and, and they, with the six wings, we know what that is, and they were full of eyes within, which means perception, and they rest not day and night, which means this is an obsession with you. This is your whole life. You never lose sight of the fact that within you is the I am. And it says, and they were saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come, Gadosh, 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 Adonai Sabayath, which is a great uh, um, coin and uh, mantra. And so, so, you know, there is one within you and there is one without in this cosmos and both are the same. And in Revelation chapter 4, in verses 9 and 10, they give glory and thanks to him that sits on the throne and the four and twenty elders fell down. We have the separate identity of the four beasts and the four and the twenty elders. So like on this star map we have the, the right ascension which is broken into twenty-four, see? But in you there is four. See? And so the four and twenty is the twenty-four which is that and the four which is in you 
which is part of your four, and you also have the four equinoxes. So the two are one. Everything is one. Everything is the same. Everything is part of the whole. Look, for instance, if atoms, as, as quantum physics is fine, if these atoms and these electrons think and they have intelligence and they consider and they change and they do things and they operate in specific ways and so forth, there's this whole intelligence going on with these subatomic particles which are atoms and that's all you are, you're atoms. So what's the difference between you and them? The difference between you and them is simply you're attached to a physical body. And so if you leave the attachment to that physical body, you then become in the same way they are. Individual identities. Remember something. Every electron has a ghost attached to it. When, when, when the electrons come out of the gun on your television set, the ghost says, let's go this way. <coughs> the ghost decides which way the electron is going to go. <coughs> Did you know that? Well, it's true. If you fire a gun, a bullet comes out, and it hits the wall. The trajectory is, you know, exactly what's going to happen. That's called Newtonian classic physics. But when electrons come out, there's a ghost. Each one has a ghost, and they say, well, I don't want to go that way. I'm going to go this way. And the only reason you see a picture on your television set is because out of the billions of electrons that come out, one of them is just bound to hit the screen. And so everything has a ghost. And, 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 and now, when you understand that, you understand subatomic particles and the, and the wisdom and the intelligence and the power out there, then what is the holy ghost? You get into, you know, it's just like if you, you study in quantum when they talk about the observers and things change by the observer. Go into the Bible and look, and look up in your concordance sometime about the watcher. The watcher. Why is the watcher important? The watcher is important the same way in quantum it's important because the observer observes and things change. The basis of quantum physics is that by observing something, you change it. And when you study and you meditate, you're observing. When you observe something, you change it. Observe yourself, you change it. And <laughs> the difference between Religion and, and physics is they've proved their case. Albert Einstein had a lot of trouble with this stuff. He dropped out. He said, I can't deal with this. But they said, Albert, why don't you come to the meetings? Because no matter, he was wrong. Although he had contributed so much to the theory of relativity, he was wrong. Look what happens in verse 10 of Revelation chapter 4. They cast their crowns. What does that mean? You cast your crown. It means you throw down your, your, your intelligence. You throw down your thought process. Or as Jesus says, you take no thought. You separate from the thoughts of the mind. You, you throw down your crown. Shutting down your mind and totally submitting to the right side in divine consciousness. Shutting down, and when you shut down your mind and the crucifixion of the lower senses takes place and the veil falls and then you are exposed to Pia Mater, your heavenly mother, who dwells within you and looking, waiting to embrace you. You have inside of you, right now, as you're sitting here looking at me, you have inside of you, at the right hemisphere of your brain, beyond the arachnoid, this thing called Pia Mater, waiting, waiting for you, waiting for you to come home. And you've been so distracted by all of the things of the earth that we, we haven't even known that she's been there. But then we find out that when Jesus was crucified, which means when that which is the sun, the, the, the lower solar energy of the flesh is crucified in the meditation, and the web falls, and Pia Mater is standing there because it says when he died, the veil was rent in two. The veil is arachnoid. And what I'm telling you, you don't look up in Bibles or New Age journals or anything like that. You look it up in the, the medical dictionaries of Stedman's and you find out that your brain is the tabernacle in the temple because it duplicates that which is the tabernacle of the temple in the Bible. There's an outer court, there's an inner holy of holies, and it's separated by a veil. Your brain has an outer covering called dura mater, an inner holy place called pia mater, separated by arachnoid, the web. Why? Why is it called pia mater, tender mother, holy mother? Why? Who named it that? Why is the holiest of the tabernacles made exactly as your brain is made? Why? 
And then who can go in that tabernacle? Who can go in that holy of holies? The priest. And what does it say in the Bible? It says you have been made a high priest because you're expected to go in there. You know how many people have gone in there? You can count them on your hand, your finger. Because nobody knows about it. Do you know if you were to walk out of this building, do you know how far you'd have to go to find out somebody that knows that the tabernacle of the outer court, the inner court, and the, and the veil is actually Dura Mater, Pia Mater, and Arachnoid, the human brain? Do you know? I would challenge you. You would probably go from here to Australia and you never met anybody who knows about it. How come you know about it sitting in a basement in Fork and River? That's weird. But you read the stories. Buddha found it out by sitting under a tree by himself. Krishna found it out by being born in a cave. And where was Jesus? Hanging around with a bunch of misfits at, in, a, in a wood somewhere. It's not the kind of stuff that, that booms out to people. But, you know, you test it. Is it right? Is it scientifically accurate? Does it make sense? Yes, it does. That's what the tabernacle is. It says in the Bible, God lives and dwells in a, in a, in a, in a, in a temple not made with hands. That's your head. That's your head. And yet you've never ever, in all the churches you've ever been to, in all the religious experience you've ever had, you've never heard it referred to. Never. Nobody's even mentioned it. And you never mentioned it. You never questioned it. And that's how, that's how far away we've gotten from the truth of what life is and what consciousness is all about and what the universe is all about. And so in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, we wrap it up. You are worthy to receive glory and honor, for you have created all things, and for your pleasure they were created. Look at that. All of these things were created for the pleasure of this thing that we call God. Isn't that interesting? And what's his pleasure? In other words, he created everything for his pleasure, or her pleasure, whatever. But I want to show you something. This is the last thing you have to look at. He created Everything for his pleasure. Go to page 609. Real quick. He created everything for his pleasure. Not for your pleasure. For his pleasure. Isaiah chapter 45. Read it out loud with me. Verse 7. Start with the word I. One, two, three. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Whoa! That blows this whole deal, doesn't it? Now, good and gentle Jesus, our holy heavenly Father, he creates evil. What is this? What kind of guy? What kind of sadistic guy we got running around at the crown here? Because for his pleasure it is necessary for each of us to submit ourselves to an energy where light and darkness, yin and yang, good and evil interact. So that we can experience, we can fail, we can learn, we can overcome, we can mature, we can be as God, we can win. That electricity is good in the hands of someone who knows how to use it. It is evil in the hands of someone who doesn't. Your car is good if you drive it for good purposes. In the hands of a drunken driver, it's evil. And so all of these things that are created, all of these powers have a neutral force, but it's how you use it. How are you going to use it? What are you going to do with it? You want to go to some place and learn how to activate Kundalini? What are you going to do with it? Okay. So, this life force, this understanding should drive us to the meditative state. We understand that there is this constant conflict between what you call good and what you call evil. And remember something also, and it's very important to understand and to realize that you may call the darkness evil, but you wouldn't. What is the first thing you do when you go into your bedroom? When you're ready to sleep, you turn off the light. And the darkness doesn't become evil. 
the darkness becomes rest. And the one man is praying, oh God, my crops are going to fail because there's a drought. Send rain. And down the street, there's a guy praying, oh God, my son is getting married and we're having the reception in the yard. Make the sun shine. And the mother is praying, oh God, I am an American and my son is carrying the banner and he's going against the, the Germans or whatever. Keep him safe. Any other one is saying, oh God, I'm a German and my son is fighting. Keep him safe. Everybody is. Who's good and who's evil? Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, it says. Depends. And even you, you live in this country, you have certain rules. And this is good, and this is evil. And you go to another place where the rules are different, and what you said is evil is good, and what you said is good is evil. Because what? None of us have attached to the center. And we've all been made to respond to our particular group, our tribe. And now you're to drift to the center. And in the center there is one. And in the center there is no separation. So you're not an American. Isn't that amazing? That's the first thing I got in trouble with when I started this thing years ago. I told people God was not an American. What's, that's a terrible <laughs> thing to say. <laughs> I know he is a Baptist. <laughs> you know? And then, and, and then you find out that you're not an American, you're not a Christian, you're not a... You're, you're, isn't it great? We're not... We would just be people. Nothing to fight about. It's like John Lennon says in the song. No reason to fight. So we learn. And now we'll reach this point where we begin to see next week sitting on the throne, the man with the book in the right hand, written within and on the back, sealed with the seven seals. And so where we're going, I hope you can see it, is integrating ourselves and the seven here with the seven there and the twelve here with the twelve there. And opening the seven seals is the same as opening the seven chakras, is transcending the seven months to pass over from what we have always known into what we look forward to knowing, to a new you, and to introduce yourself to your mother. Say, Mom, I didn't know. <laughs> and all of these strange people who taught you their ways, you've given them all up. You're free now. Wipe off all the dust and all the insanity and be free. And just like the little guy in the movie, lift your finger and the other finger will come down and touch yours and the two will light and you'll finally say, just like they said in that little allegorical movie, home, 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 watch, bye. <laughs>